the reason. Thank you so much, guys. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's get into it. So today's all going to be about some questions and answers. I've got my Indian, my, my minion helping me out with, with the stream who has done a fantastic job so far. No, you may not have my Red Bull CJ. I saw your email, by the way. I'll get to that. Um, I'm going to do some news and then go through some awesome questions that you've asked. So hopefully we can get through it. And terribly sorry about the false start. When this uploads, I'll edit it so it starts from this point. And hopefully it never happens again. Because I, I don't change settings, it just seems to not work every time. Anyway, in terms of news, Octoprint. You may have heard, you guys, if you've not heard of Octoprint before, it's a basically a way to control your 3D printer remotely via a Raspberry Pi or any low-cost laptop you might have lying around. It's a fantastic, fantastic idea, and Gina, or she's nicknamed Foozle, is behind it. Uh, but what really sucks is she's been developing it pretty much as a full-time job with funding and her funding's being cut. So if you're interested in the Octo, Octoprint project, she has a Patreon up now to help support further development of that project. So obviously you need to develop it as more as you know as more 3D printers come out on the market to keep it fresh. So I'll put a Patreon link in the uh, the description of this video once I'm done uh, with this stream. But it's she's on Patreon to search Octoprint Patreon, you'll be able to find it. Definitely a worthy cause. Um, it's a really cool project, and I haven't used Octoprint myself yet, but heaps of you guys I know use it, so definitely check that out. Uh, other news, this is a little bit old now, but Pinshape, just to update some of you guys, Pinshape announced like start of this month or last end of last month that they were shutting down, um, and they're back up now, if you might not know. They actually, because they were announcing they were shutting down, they got heaps of people flooding to the site, which boosts their numbers. And then they must have gotten something. They didn't say what it was, but they must have gotten some funding or something or more support. So Pinshape is not dead. Pinshape still exists somehow. <laughs> so just letting you know that it's not dead. You might have missed the update where it actually they just said um, it's, it's, we're still here. So that's Pinshape. And final news, yes, the Trinus 3D printer. So... I've been in touch with Bojan over at Trinus, who's been a really great guy. I've been talking to him a lot on email and learning more about this project. I've actually got a pre-production unit of the Trinus on its way to test out. No laser, unfortunately, because I haven't got the, the certification for the laser unit yet. But in terms of the 3D printer, it looks really good. They've got over $700,000 raised, which is r ridiculous. They didn't even need nearly that much money. But I will tell you the final word if it's good or not. So they've still got uh, just over, just under two weeks. So 13 days left on the campaign. If you're interested in getting one, it's a tiny build volume. It's like 120 mil cubed, very, very small. But it's pretty cheap. It's sort of like 300 bucks or something US plus shipping for the basic model. So I will let you know what it's like, definitely. And hopefully it arrives before the campaign ends. But we'll see. So that's mostly it just for the news, just a few small things that I wanted to cover. Uh, and as I said, last, last week we tried to do this, we had all sorts of questions asked in the stream and it got a bit, bit too crazy. So I've actually gone through and gotten some questions during the week and also asked on Patreon, uh, asked some of you guys questions on there. So yeah, without further ado, I'm going to go through them and my lovely minion will be interrupting me if there's any really, really good key points or anything that she wants to point out to my attention. All good? So the first question I got through Patreon was through Shazman and he said, I'd be interested to know if you've printed any flexible filaments or non-standard filaments on the Cocoon Create. For those who don't know, the Cocoon Create is a WANHAL duplicated i3 version 2. It's just a rebrand that was sold through Aldi in Australia. Uh, so I picked on it recently and flexible filaments look cool to print with. So my experience with the Mark 10 extruder on the Wanhao i3 or Cocoon Create is that it just cannot do flexible materials at all. I have tried in the past. Sometimes it works for a while, but because extruding flexible materials is very strange, it, they, they squish, they stretch, they find any of the you know, least path of resistance to escape the extruder assembly. Uh, there's just the, the standard Mark 10 extruders just don't work very well for flexible materials, especially like stuff like NinjaFlex. In my opinion, I've never gotten it to work. 
So that's why I've got the Flex Unit Extruder, which I'm testing out soon. And that's designed to print flexible materials. And it's like a, a bolt-on addition to the, the Wanhao i3 or those style of i3 printers. So it's designed to fully support the extruder material all the way through. Yes. Okay, this is actually an interest to me. Um, Joseph has asked, did Olo get in touch about sending you a printer? They told me you were. So have you had any updates about the Olo? They told you they were, what, really? Interesting. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks for letting me know. Um, no, they went radio silence after I made that second video. They, I, I sort of, I emailed them back saying, hey guys, thanks for your, your email. I've made a response video. Let me know what you think and get back in touch. And they just went silent. So they've, they've lied. When do they say that? Because they've lied to you. <laughs> no one's gotten back in touch with me. Uh, recently, I've been in touch with a few manufacturers like uh, Zmorph. They're interested in sending me a, a, a test unit, a, a loaner unit. Uh, but no, definitely not Olo. And that's pretty interesting because, yeah, they just went dead silent. They told me that they hope you enjoy your printer. You sure it was Olo and not Trinus? Because <laughs> I've got a Trinus on the way, but definitely not Olo. That's, that's messed up. If they're using my like reputation to mislead people, especially you, that's, that's bad. And just one final, um, yes. final question before I let you go on. Um, I think this is a pretty um, a good, a good one um, and a simple one. Um, it's like um, he's interested in kit printers, like assembly. Mm -hmm. Can you get decent prints from them? What's your opinion? You can, yeah. So the question is about kit printers, and if you can get decent prints from kit printers, you absolutely can. Look, building a anything from a kit, like a, a CNC machine, you know, building anything from parts you can definitely get good results and 3D printers are no different. The only reason I tend to tell newcomers to 3D printing to avoid kits is your lead time to getting that good print. Sorry, I got itchy nose. Lead time to getting that good print is long. Whereas you might get a 3D printer uh, that's ready to run like the Up Mini or even Fabricator Mini and have it printing within 20 minutes or so. Kit printer, you're looking to put at least an entire weekend's effort into assembling it, probably more. And then once you've done that, you have to calibrate it and then all that. But once you do that, you probably, I guess I'm going to start getting good prints. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely possible. Just be, keep in mind, you will have to put the hours in. It's not assembled. Someone else has put the hours into assembling printers that you buy when they're ready to run. You are putting the time in. That's your time, that worth whatever that is per hour, to make that kit printer work. Um, just a quick, can people hear me better now? <laughs> I can move the mic a bit closer to my minion. And there goes my 4G dongle. Cool. So I'm going to move on to more of the Patreon questions. So Scott said, hello Angus, I was wondering if you could discuss tips of printing ABS on a non-heated bed printer. I have an Affinibot Rockstock Delta kit should never be able to get working, <laughs> bad first printer hashtag. Um, I found a MakerBot Replicator Mini for 255 bucks. <laughs> Contrary to the evil that gets spread about this printer, mine seems to work great, but I want to play, play with some ABS on it. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I do seem to hate a lot on the, the MakerBots, but that's just because my experience with the fifth gen wasn't very good. With printing ABS, size, it's, size matters. It's all about how big you want to print. On the Fabricator Mini, you can print ABS. Chuck over at Chuck's channel, Chuck's EL Products channel, he does ABS prints on his Fabricator Mini all the time. Not a heated bed, you know, he puts build tack down and it works. But the prints are small, they're pretty small. And the way ABS shrinkage rates work is the larger something is, the more volume there is of material in it, the more percentage it's gonna shrink overall and the more warping you're gonna get. So I've used machines like the Mankati, which has a 250, 250, 300 build volume. The bottom of it might print ABS fine, but as soon as you start getting away from that heated bed, things start failing. You'll get lamin you know, delamination where the layers split apart. So yes, you probably can. I don't think there's a preset in the, in the Replicator Mini to even let you heat up to ABS temperatures, though it, it's a pretty locked down machine, but don't quote me on that. But if you can print ABS on a non-heated bed, it will be very small parts. Like I'd say you're limited to about that large and you might have to 
heat up the, the area around it with a hot air gun or something like that. But yeah, give it a go, but don't don't keep get your hopes up. Just an interesting point. Yes. CD printing stated, Makeup Bob provides the fuel for the fire that burns in the depths of hell. What's your comment on that? <laughs> Uh, MakerBot is just a running joke now. Uh, honestly, uh, it's it's almost like the big name of 3D printers just literally... My, my conspiracy theory is they bought... Like, Stratasys bought MakerBot to destroy the, the brand. That is my conspiracy mind ticking over. I feel that they have big bucks coming in from their, their industry-level printers. They want to ruin consumer expectations and consumer faith in lower-end printers... Which is why the latest MakerBot is, you know, PLA only, loud, clunky. They had all the issues with the extruder. I don't think the original MakerBot team had anything sinister behind them, but most of them are gone now because of layoffs. And Bree Peters also bailed. Um, so yeah, I. <laughs> every time someone says they're going to make a bot, and like I mean, some people get them to work, but my experience was just shocking. And I like how they came up with the the improved smart extruder as something you had to buy to as if like all the the failed problems that that came out because of their previous smart extruder as if that was like the consumer problem consumer's problem not theirs so i don't know how the class action lawsuit is going against makerbot but i hope i hope that you know they come out worse for wear because it's it's hasn't been very fun for them yeah that's that's my that's my reasoning for makerbot uh yeah so let's roll on through some more questions so, we've got Jos van der Plas. I, I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Uh, your recent Zebra Bed review was great, but I found it a little strange you didn't talk about PEI, which seems to be the industry's current favorite. So, what's your opinion on PEI? That's a great question. And be, for those who don't know, PEI is Altem. It's a plastic sheet, very, very high temperature resistance that people are using now for their print beds. And to be completely honest with you, I can't get hold of any. Um, so in Australia, I, I looked at some plastic manufacturers, they wanted to charge me a small fortune for some of it, and overseas, it's like twice as much to get it shipped than it is for the actual sheet. Um, but yeah, I'm absolutely willing to test it out, it looks great. I've used sort of similar materials like, um, like Garolite on the, the Robox, which works well, so from what I've heard, PPI is even better for adhering down ABS prints, and yeah, I just didn't really mention it because it was wasn't really relevant to the review, but I really do want to test it and I want to get my, you know, get my two cents on that surface. I've actually heard some really weird things as well about strange print surfaces. Uh, I don't remember the name of the guy, maybe in the chat, uh, who s sent through printing onto like heat film, how's it called? Lamination film. So he's 3D printing onto a bed wrapped in laminating film and it's, apparently that works. So I want to try out all these crazy, wacky ideas like printing onto postage labels and stuff like that and just see what, what works. But I, I am trying to get hold of a PEI sheet. I was actually looking last night of where to get it, but I haven't found one where the shipping isn't astronomical. So if you know, or if you would like to help me get some, because you can just send it in an envelope, do, do please let me know. Uh, Carl asks, how to ensure the best finish possibly by adjusting support settings and other tips when you need to use supports. So I can't give any, any uh, uh, examples in this sort of video, but basically from what he's asking, I understand that scarring from support material can turn a lot of people off using supports in their prints. And there is a few settings you can tweak in terms of getting your supports dialed in. To be completely honest, I have never really changed the defaults from Simplify 3D. And even in Cura, I didn't really need to change the defaults. That's also big news. I, I basically, it came to my attention that there's a new version of Cura that's come out like the last few days. I'm going to be testing that out. Apparently, it's really, really good. And I haven't seen it yet, but that's something to look out for. But in terms of, yeah, adjusting support settings, if your supports don't come off the print without serious damage to the print, then your support separation distance is too close. That's easy to change in most slices. Uh, but other than that, yeah, it just comes down to cooling and other settings which are printer specific. Uh, Dave also asks, just a quick question about testing. You've got your torture tests which are designed for printers, but is there any specific models that you use for testing filaments? 
There's a US, UK, sorry, UK company called Global FSD. Yes, I know Global FSD. They're really cool. They, um, yeah, so they specialize in samples of all kinds of crazy printer filaments. And I want to make the most of 10, mil, 10 meters or less. Oh, yeah, they only send like 10 meter wraps. Uh, so to answer your question, Dave, because you're not in the live stream, <laughs> so hopefully you'll, you'll see this. Uh, I don't tend to have a specific file I use, but if I'm just testing a filament, I'll tend to print something really tiny, like a, I designed a fennec fox ring a while ago, which is just, there's this low poly fennec fox on Thingiverse, I put a ring around it. It takes 10 minutes to print or so. Or I'll do something really boring like a cube, like a 20 mil cube. That's my, that tends to be my standard sample print. Uh, because it prints quickly, lets me test deviation and that sort of that sort of thing. Ten meters is not much filament, though. You're really going to be struggling, especially if a Bowden style extruder. You, you're going to lose that much filament anyway with the Bowden setup. So it's not a bad idea designing a, a file to use for different filaments. I tend to just I tend to choose files that complement the filaments. Like with the wood, I did the cat because the cat looked nice in wood, or I did the bender head. Uh, or if I'm doing something clear, I'll do something that looks nice with light through it. But having a standard file isn't a bad idea, so I'll consider that. Okay, just a couple of questions from your stream. Go ahead. Okay, so Benjamin Ransom asks, have you heard any plans from Hobby King to start shipping the Fabricator Mini from the Australian warehouse? Uh, no. Um, Hobby King has been historically quite terrible for stock because when something gets popular, like the Fabricator Mini, it tends to become pre-ordered and... Not to rag on Hobby King too much, they tend to send the, the stock to places which have the higher demand, so Australia tends to lose out. It's like how we had a whole shipment of Xboxes a few years ago, diverted to, I think it was America, I can't remember, instead of coming to Australia because of the higher demand there. So Australia tends to lose out, we're always the last to get things. So if you're after a Fabricator Mini urgently, the different the differences between the different models, like the Australian or the UK warehouse or the or US warehouse, it's just a different plug. The, the adapter itself, you can unplug. It's just a standard IEC uh, computer cable. Uh, it, you can just plug in your local you know, Australian 2, 230 volt one and the adapter will work fine. So if you want to get one urgently and you can't be bothered waiting any longer in the Australian warehouse, grab it from the international warehouse. That's where I got mine. Uh, I could not be bothered waiting for it to come to the Australian warehouse because you'll be waiting ages. <laughs> no doubt about that. Any other ones for the stream? ABS printing, will a cardboard box around the cocoon create work? Sparky setups like that. Yes, absolutely it does. Uh, I used to run up plus twos and they have a heated bed. They're designed to print ABS, but in a cold winter room, it will still warp horribly. You can literally put a 3D printer in a box and it will greatly improve your ABS printing. The only downside, well, there's two, two downsides. One, you can't see it printing. So I would recommend if you could get like a clear even like a shower curtain or something, kind of to look through it. it a better solution would be a bit, a bit of plexiglass, like a bit of, um, a bit of clear perspex. But the second downside is you start to overheat other components. So these machines aren't designed to be completely enclosed and heated because the stepper motors are getting hot, the extruders getting hot, the control boards are getting hot. And I would find if I put like the up plus two again in a box for too long, the entire extruder assembly would overheat and the extruder will jam and clog. So it will definitely help, just don't overdo it. And st speaking of overdoing it, I he I'm hesitant to re recommend this, but if it's a really cold room, you can get a hot air gun, blast into the cardboard box for about 10 seconds, then close the lid just before it starts printing. And that will really improve your first layer adhesion and improve the ambient temperature for those first few prints before the printer kind of equalizes that, that, that temperature. So yeah, definitely give it a go if you want to print ABS prints and you're struggling, because it will, will help. So another question that um, pops up, you know, pops up quite frequently is what filament do you use most frequently? Yeah, actually, uh, I was thinking about that the other day because I'm starting to run out of it. I print with eSun ABS at the moment most of the time. And that's mostly because I print on the UPS with my with ABS and UPS are designed for ABS. They don't print PLA very well, in my opinion. They, they do now. It prints OK on the UP box, but... I don't know why you'd bother. It's an enclosed printer. Print ABS, it's stronger. So eSun is so cheap. It's super cheap. I used to buy it from Hobby King, but they seem to have moved on to this Kaleido filament now, which I haven't tried. Uh, but that would be my go-to ABS filament. And it doesn't really have much smell to it. 
it, do, it does tend to have a bit of a quality control issue. I've had some people having issues with it, but I've had no problems. In terms of PLA, I print a whole range because obviously I get samples from different companies. So it depends really what color I'm after. I, I really like the verbatim PLA. That, that's quite nice. It's a nice white as well. Um, the 3D Fuel uh, A PLA is a nice high temperature one as well. But yeah, really, I mean, I print in loads of different, different filaments, like even if it's just no name Chinese PLA, which might be really brittle and horrible. If it's the color I need, I'll try to print with it. So yeah, I'd say eSun would be the one I use the most just because it's so cheap. <laughs> Uh, I'll just do another um another Patreon one. Okay. No yeah. Worries. Okay. So, Marcelo asks, uh, is there any way to we can use Simplify 3D on the CEL Robox? So, that's an interesting question because the CEL Robox has a really strange extruder setup. It's got two extruder nozzles, but only one filament feed, and it uses two needle valves to move these nozzles. It tilts them, you know, up and down to change between a 0.3 and a 0.4 millimeter, sorry, 0.3 and a 0.8 millimeter nozzle. So you can print fast with a 0.8 or you can print fine with a 0.3. Controlling that extruder is weird. It's, it's complicated. And from what I understand, the, uh, the, the automaker, I think it's the, is the CEL Robox software, runs, I think it uses Cura to Slice from memory but it has its own own G-code add-ins to control that strange extruder head. So I'm sure Simplify 3D with the right G-code add-ins could work, but I, you would very much run the risk of breaking something because those needle valves are very, very delicate and they have a sort of a, a grommet pressure release. And if that blows, you're going to have a head full of molten PLA before you, could, before you know it. And obviously when that sets, that extruder head is, is done. So I would not recommend it. The, the Robox software is actually really good. It's not bad. And if you really wanted to try it, I would be prepared to lose the extruder head. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that would be my answer for that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. Another, another stream one? Um, yes. So um, Rue Martins earlier asks, how will 3D printing um, evolve in the next three, um, next six years? Have you had any thoughts on that yet, or will you be addressing that in a future stream? Uh, well, we can talk about it now, because actually CJ Printing, so CJ sent through an email just before the stream asking pretty much the same thing. What, where do you think 3D printing will be in the next five to ten years? Um, he was talking about in terms of market. I think they're talking about in terms of technology. Um, yes, by the looks of it, technology. Technology, yeah. So... Some of you may, may have seen the new M-Core 3D printer. It's, the way M-Core works is it's, it's based off paper. It's a paper laminated process. Uh, I think it's originally called LOM, Laminated Object Manufacturing. Uh, so the M-Core printer is a paper 3D printer. And they've gotten the price point down to just under 10,000 US, which is pretty crazy for a machine that's pretty big and prints full color paper 3D prints that feel like wood because they're solid paper. That's pretty cool, but the next next leap in technology is going to be the HP printer. I have no doubt about it. They announced it probably two years ago, and it's just coming into beta testing now. It's a powder-based system with some proprietary something magic going on. It's got it's something like six colors, extremely strong. They, they showed them using a shackle that was printed, lifting the, the inventor's car using it. Uh, and the machine itself is about the size of a small photocopier absolutely ridiculous they're not going to be cheap they're going to be about fifty thousand dollars i think but in terms of imagine your know, office works or your local print studio you know regular printer studio having one of those printers you go to it's powder based so support structures are no problem at all it just it doesn't need them it just comes away that the powder is the support and color and strength that's going to lead the way i think fdm definitely has a, a lifespan it's easy to do you know people can do it at home it's safe but it's not the future of 3D printing. There will be something else. I think also Carbon 3D is now, they've announced their, their, you know, their proprietary constant fast uh, 3D printing process with resins. So you can now pre-order, I think, a Carbon 3D printer. It's pretty expensive, but that's a really, really fast resin-based system. So the innovations are continuing. And I think in a couple of years time, we'll see some small, like I hate on the Olu a lot, 
But I think that idea of a small resin printer that's safe is quite nice. Using a smartphone is dumb, in my opinion. But with a small screen built into it and a resin that you can touch with your hands without worrying about cancer, <laughs> which they show in the video, uh, I think that would change everything in terms of getting it accessible because that that you know high detail resin prints that's what we all want imagine making miniatures and stuff at home you know games workshop would be terrified they'd go broke overnight if that was possible so i think that's where we're headed and it would be silly to think that fdm will be in that future somewhere because it's just it's too rough to be completely honest hmm so, theme park attraction asks, what is the latest 3D patent that you're most excited about being implemented? Have you had any look at that recently? Patents? Um, no, actually. I tend to get more excited when patents expire because they unlock industry uh, control over technologies. So, for example, Stratasys have patents on everything. I mean, they try to patent printing in pieces and gluing it together. And I see that as a real stifler for the, te for the industry. 3D printing took so long to come out because patents were holding onto it and protecting it from being implemented by other people. So yes, patents are in place to protect the inventor's investment into the invention and make the money. I completely get that. Uh, but I tend to see a more wider adoption of technology once patents expire. So like with SLS, that patent expired two or, th two or so years ago. We haven't seen a cheap SLS 3D printer yet, but it's, I reckon it's around the corner. And silly things like an enclosed heated chamber, that's technically still patented. So, yeah, that, that's interesting. Although I haven't seen any, I haven't looked at any super new, like, awesome technology patents. Like, I totally get Carbon 3D patenting their, their oxygen, oxygen permeable membrane technology. That's totally fine by me. It, it's, it's a crazy idea. But uh, I haven't seen any other ones than that. So if you've got any others, put them in a link and I'll get my minion to point them out to me. And I'll look at them at a future date. Cool. So I'll just go through one more Patreon one. Bryce asks how to deal with tolerances. So in terms of tolerances, 3D printing is not an exact process. Nothing's an exact process. You can't cut a piece of wood to exactly 10 by 10 by 10 millimeters or whatever. And same with 3D printing, you can't print exactly, nothing's exact. So you need what's called tolerances to allow things to fit together. So, like I said in my recent video on making a speed controller mount for my combat robot, I tend to allow 0.3 millimeters of tolerance between parts, if I can, if I want them to freely move around each other. If I want them to be a press fit, I'll do 0.1 millimeters of tolerances, and depending on you know, plus or minus, I might experiment. If I want it to be, you know, directly touching, you might do zero, but keep in mind zero is actually, you're probably going to end up with a uh, interference fit, which is where they actually, yeah, interfere with each other. That's good for stuff if you're tapping it, for example, if you're tapping a hole for a thread, you want, an, you want a tight interference fit so you can t t tap into it. Or press fits are okay as well, where you sort of, you use a soft rubber mallet to press, hammer something in. But with 3D printing, that obviously wouldn't, doesn't tend to end very well. But it's also important to know what your printer is capable of. So that's why I go back to the 20 mil cube, like, you know, 20 millimeters uh, on all sides. I'll print that off on my 3D printer and use my pair of calipers to see if it is actually 20 millimeters. It might be 19.8 millimeters. It might be 21 millimeters. You don't really know what your printer is capable of till you can benchmark what the, what the actual accuracy is of it. You know, my, the art box might be less accurate than the fabricated mini. The fabricated mini might be more accurate than the row box. You don't know until you test it. And once you test it, you can then start planning for it. That's how I approach tolerances. I'm going to have some water. Got another question from the stream, or should I continue on to other ones? Oh, no, I've, I've got a, a few good ones on, on the stream noted here. Um, in fact, I probably won't be taking any more questions at this point. Yep. Yeah. Um, We've got a few more to go through. Okay, so so um, 3D print everything. Uh, um, asked earlier, have you tried Ethan's wood filament? Because it sucks for me. <laughs> I'm not surprised. A lot of wood filaments I've tried, uh, just to go back if you didn't hear that. Um, have you tried Ethan's wood filament? I've tried a lot of wood filaments and they have all, except for the filamentives wood uh, PLA, 
they've all sucked completely for me. Uh, I'm, I'm trying some from a local supplier, 3D printing systems. I haven't tried that yet. Um, but I think a lot of wood, wood filaments tend to have too large grain size in them. They're not properly mulched down into small particles, so you get blockages. And once that blockage occurs, it makes this horrible resiny goop that just, oh, just gums up extruders like nothing else. So uh, I am always very careful of wood filaments, and I'm not surprised the Esun wood PLA sucks. You might need to print with a larger diameter nozzle. So I think a lot of people tend to go to a 0.8, even 0.8 millimeter nozzle to print uh, wood filaments reliably without jams. Because if you print with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, you're very likely to get jams. It's just the particle sizes are just too large. Plus it's very soft. I mean, adding wood to it doesn't make it stronger. It makes it softer. So extruders tend to chew it up a lot quicker and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I should get hold, to, hold of some because I'm looking for a filament to just absolutely rip apart. Because I'm, I'm struggling to come across filament that just doesn't work. So I might buy some. And I've got another question from, from you, man, that I uh, wrote down. So 3D Print Everything uh, also asked me in, in another video, how do you get so much stuff to review? And there's a really, really good Linus Tech Tips video. I am wearing their hoodie because it's nice and comfortable. I'm a big fan of their channel. They made an, uh, Linus made an awesome video, honest answers, asking, you know, addressing how they get their review samples. And it's pretty simple. Just to, just to address that, a company makes a product and they like, you know, they, they stand behind their product and they think it's awesome. They want to put it out there to the community to see what they think. So they look for people who influence that community. And I am somehow one of those people. So they get in touch with me and they say, hey, you know, Angus, can we send you our product for you to do a review on? And when I say yes, I say yes, I will do an unbiased review. I don't take any money for these products. I'm like, yes, you can send it to me and I will review it. I will test it out. But the, the opinion will be my own. You know, it's not going to be influenced by anything else. And if their product is good and they believe it's good, then, you know, by all means, they, they do it. And as you, you might notice, I don't tend to do negative reviews very often because if a company stands behind their product, they're you know, they're likely to have a pretty good product. They're unlikely to send you something that they, they know is crap because I'm not going to pretend it's not. I will rip it apart. So that's how it happens. And it's sort of the cheapest marketing a company could have, you know, flicking one or two review samples to someone versus a, you know, thousands of dollars on a, e on a, on a Facebook campaign or something like that. So that's how it sort of happens. Uh, I don't always keep them. Sometimes they're loaner units, so they'll go back to the company or sometimes I'll just borrow them. So I used to work at a 3D printing studio in Perth and I would just borrow their machines. I borrowed their Up Plus, I borrowed their, their you know, Flashforge Dreamer, I borrowed their Robox and I did reviews on that when I was getting started. So yeah, that's, that's how it happens. Or I buy it as well. I bought the Fabricator Mini and I often review things that I buy for 3D printing because yeah, that, that's what, what better way to get a complete unbiased perspective of how something works and what I think of it. So that's that question. Yeah, go. Um, so Pinpock asks, uh, what's the best CAD software you've encountered? So, <laughs> I often get asked, what's the best of something? So, what's the best 3D printer? And in this case, what's the best CAD software? There is no best. That, that word does not apply to this industry at all. In terms of the, the one that I like to use, that would be SolidWorks because I was taught SolidWorks. I know how to use it. I can draw stuff fast in it. The problem with SolidWorks is it's extremely expensive. There's no free version of it. So that's not very useful to most of you. I use Onshape a lot at the moment. That's like sort of a free parametric modeler kind of like SolidWorks. Downside, it runs on the cloud, it runs on the internet. And again, being in Australia, it runs quite slowly for me. And it's free up to 10 documents privately, then you have to pay. A lot of you have recommended Fusion 360, which I am absolutely gonna check out because I didn't know you could get it for free without being a student, but you can if you don't earn more than 100k or something like that per year, which I don't yet. Uh, so I'm definitely gonna check that out. Fusion 360 is very, very popular and quite powerful and free if you're a student, as I said. But if you're just getting started, you might wanna look at Tinkercad. You know, Chuck over at his channel and Joel as well use Tinkercad all the time for really cool stuff. It's super simple. It runs online, but it's designed so even primary school kids can pick it up. So yeah, that would be my answer. There's no best. It really comes down to what you want to get started with, what you want to get out of it, and also possibly if you want to spend any money on it. Because once you start spending money, you can get some really amazing packages. 
But in terms of free, there is a lot of good stuff around. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but yeah, you, you can't just address that with one answer, <laughs> one word. Um, and just another quick, quick question from Extreme 3 d He asked me, what do you do with all the 3D prints you make? So obviously I print loads of stuff to test out printers, and I end up with a lot of 3D prints that are kind of useless because I tend to print out you know, decorative things. So they slowly accumulate in my set back there. Um, you know, case in point, this is an amazing, this is a snake that is uh, from the Scan the World initiative. This was printed on the Rigibot 2, which I'm testing out at the moment. It's a great print. I mean, it's fantastic. But when I'm done with the review, you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I might put it in the garden or something. But to be honest, I do clear them out once every few months. If they're something that's not very useful, like the, you know, the torture tests I did a while ago, it's not really worth keeping them. So I do clear them out. And I print a lot in PLA when I can on these machines. So I'm not too worried about you know, the environmental impact. But I do feel guilty when I throw away ABS prints. I definitely do because they're petroleum based. But there's no real system in place to recycle them. So that's what I do. There's not enough space to keep them. And I feel sorry for Joel. I mean, I don't know how Joel over at 3D Printing Nerd has so many massive prints that he just keeps. I don't, I don't like, he printed the Easter egg I designed that big. I don't know where he keeps them, like, probably in that spare bedroom of his. <laughs> Thank you, because your answer cleared up a lot for him. No worries, dude. Um, and secondly, HM Pirates asked earlier, my ambient temperature in the room is above 40 Celsius and between um, 40. 80 to 90 percent humidity. How do I get good prints? Did you say 40? Um, yeah, 40 Celsius. Wow. Okay, just to reiterate that. Uh, so he's got a room with 40 degrees Celsius ambient temperature and what 80 to 90 humidity that's crazy that's like does he live like in a tropical jungle or something that's sort of like queensland weather in the height of summer that's hard that is really difficult so your your heat is okay you could print stuff okay with that temperature it's the humidity that's going to come and bite you so a lot of people don't know this but even abs absorbs moisture from the air and what you might notice is over time your prints start to look rough you get bubbling out of the extruder as it's, as it's printing, you get stringing suddenly out of a roll of filament that didn't string when you first opened it. That's the humidity affecting your filament. And it is a big problem. So what I've seen some people do is they'll get actually a drying box. I think Bilby 3D in Sydney actually sell them now. And it basically, it's a, it's a humidity control chamber that dries the filament out while you're not using it. So you need a filament to be not completely dry, so it's brittle, but too much humidity and too much moisture in it will impact your prints very negatively so one solution you could do is you get, you get a uh, like a, a Tupperware container that fits the roll in fill it up with desiccants they're really cheap to buy uh, you know to, to dry out that that chamber and then put a small hole like a little grommet or something to to sort of keep the humidity out and run that into your printer so your filament is in a complete controlled environment until it hits the printer and then you should be okay if your printer is overheating in that room there's not much you can do Unfortunately, 40 degrees is pretty hot. I mean, you should be printing in ABS because you're not going to have any issues at all printing ABS at that temperature. But PLA, you might start to find your printers jamming up just because it can't cool down enough. And I don't know what solution there would be other than some sort of air conditioning in that case. Because these machines do get quite hot when they run. And if they can't dissipate the heat efficiently enough, then they will start jamming up. But yeah, that's, that's a pretty extreme case. I'm, good luck to you. Um, okay, so some questions from stream? Yeah, a couple more questions from stream and then we'll start wrapping it up, I believe. I've, I don't have any more questions from Patreon. Okay, um, so first of all, they would like you to refer me to Lady Muse, which is a nickname that's now been picked up. And I okay, like, so. Th this is Lady Muse now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, let's see. So I've got, I think, about two more left. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, someone asked earlier, unfortunately I lost the name. Um, that a lot of people are waiting for you to review the Trinius 3D. Could you give us an update? So Yeah, um, you might have come in after I talked about the Trinus at the start of the stream. So just to recap, uh, I've been in touch with Trinus quite a lot. Uh, Bojan, or Bojan, however you say his name. He's sending me a Trinus. It's on its way right now, so it's in transit. It's a pre-production unit, so it has no laser because the laser on the Trinus is not approved yet 
for it's not certified yet to be used by people so um, just to cover their backs they haven't sent it with the machine so it's just a standard trinus with a heated bed uh, for 3d printing and I will be testing it out as soon as I can um, their campaign has 13 days left so I hope it arrives in time for me to do a review I won't have much time to test it so it's gonna be a bit of a first look more than a review because I want to get it out while the campaign's still there to help influence you guys but uh, yeah, it's on its way. It's a small printer. Don't don't be fooled. It's only about 120, 120 cubes. So very small print volume. The stock one only has a non-heated bed, so you're only going to be doing PLA on it. But in terms of design, it looks really funky, and I'm really really keen to test it out. So you'll you'll know straight away um, when I get it. If you if you follow me on Twitter, I don't post too much, but I will absolutely post when I get that machine, and I'll post pictures as I'm setting it up because it comes in parts. It comes in you know three identical. Or three or four identical sections that bolt together which is really cool that's why i was attracted to it in the first time first place so yeah it, it is coming very soon oh yeah. cj printing also asked <laughs> can you please move to america um i am considering moving somewhere honestly this australia we will we'll be we'll behind in, in terms of internet speed we're looking at a graph and we were behind kazakhstan for internet speed in australia australia is worse than kazakhstan if it was possible, we would love to go and live in America, but unfortunately it's not feasible right now. No, not for a while. Um, but we are definitely looking at getting a better internet connection and ramping things up because it's, it's, it's what holds it back. It's an internet thing. It needs good internet. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Any more? We'll just follow up with a couple more stream questions and then I think we'll finish up. Okay, so again, apologies. This one was asked quite a while ago, but I do think it's a really good one. So Raymond Johnston asked, um, do you really think 3D printing will become completely propriety? Don't you think that would ruin the current community packet into the thing if you want to buy full 3D printing? So sorry if that didn't make sense. but did you I think I get what you're saying, yeah. So uh, it's t I don't like using existing examples because it's not really exact and it's not going to make too much sense but if you look at the open source software market for example you've got stuff like linux you've got all, all sort of open software initiatives but then you have closed software you have windows you have you know countless proprietary programs they seem to exist fairly comfortably side by side and you get different demographics. You get people who just want to use something for what it is. They don't care about how it works. They don't care what the, what codes behind it. It just does what they need. And then you get people who want to engage in the community. Who, and as you said, like three D printing, you want to get behind the scenes, want to want to contribute, and all that sort of stuff. Where it gets nasty is when open source stuff gets pilfered for closed source stuff, like we saw with MakerBot becoming closed source after being built up on open source information of the RepRap community. So that's where it gets interesting and a little bit iffy in terms of in terms of legality and it does upset a lot of people. I don't think the open source 3D printing community will ever die as such, but I think we're going to start to see a lot more consumer friendly, ready to run printers that just do everything for you. You load the cartridge, you hit print and it works doesn't work you take it back to your store and say it doesn't work I want my money back or I want another printer whereas at the moment if a printer doesn't work and we buy it we get the part from the supplier in the mail and we have to fit it ourselves to the printer and that's limiting the the scope of 3d printing quite a bit because a lot of people don't even know you know what is this allen key thing I can't even assemble with IKEA furniture how am I meant to fit this new belt to my printer so it's two different demographics I think they can coexist but yeah, it's, I think we'll see a lot more examples in the future of this whole stealing of open source into closed source stuff. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of that again, unfortunately, happening in the future, like we saw with MakerBot. But yeah, that's my opinion. I, I, don't see, I don't really mind if something's closed source as long as it works properly. I, again, I tend to see 3D printing as a tool. As long as it prints perfectly, then I'm happy. If it doesn't print perfectly and I can't open it up to fix it, I get upset, so that's why I had such a problem with the MakerBot Replicator 5th Gen because it didn't work and I couldn't legally open it or it would void the warranty. You know, okay, <laughs> what do I do then? So that's how, I, that's how I see it. So that's probably time for one more? Um, yeah, one more. Time for one more. To, um, 
Yeah, so I think unfortunately, guys, the last question we have is one that people have asked um, a couple of times is what is the worst print you've ever had? <sighs> I've had a lot of bad prints in my time. A lot of a lot of shocking prints. Probably, I wouldn't say worst because obviously the worst is where it's just noodles, where it detaches off the print bed within the first few layers and you don't see it till the next morning. That's like the worst print. I have had from a customer, a printer come in, it was a Flashforge Dreamer, where it had detached and then formed an entire ball of PLA around the entire extruder, literally that big, because they let it run for 20 hours without looking at it, and then asked, said it was our, pro our fault that it was like that. So I had to chip away this hardened PLA from an extruder block. That was probably the worst I've ever seen in terms of disaster, but the most, the funniest print I've ever experienced was on a, on a uh, again a man catio <laughs> an ultimaker clone and it had extrusion problems it wasn't extruding out properly it was like only spinning out a tiny bit of filament in little dips every few millimeters and i put in this huge nice sort of bottle design thing and i came back to this bird's nest kind of design so it wasn't it didn't fail but it kind of didn't extrude properly so it had this bottle shape it was massive, like, you know, about 300 millimeters high that looked like it was made out of bird's nest, basically. Like, had holes all through it, but somehow made the shape. <laughs> I've got a picture somewhere. I will stick it on my Twitter after this. It was a pretty impressive print. I did keep it because it was just so ridiculous. But <laughs> that was probably the most impressive failure I've had outside of prints just um, turning into noodles and going everywhere in the print bed. That, I mean, that happens to all of us, doesn't it? Yeah, that was probably the most impressive failure I've done. So thank you so much for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed this stream. Hope I got a lot of your questions covered. Again, uh, if you want to ask me questions between now and next week, you can email them through to me or let them know in the comments and I'll try to get to them. Terribly sorry about the whole stream problem. I think I, what I'm going to have to do is just do these live unscheduled streams at 12 o'clock each week. So I can't put one up ahead of time, which is annoying. I just, I don't know what was going on there. I couldn't log into the other one. I had to go to this one. So thank you so much for bearing with me. Again, sorry about the, the reverb problem. I don't even know why that happened. I don't change anything between each week. So hopefully that doesn't happen again next week and I can start on time. Uh, and if you're not subscribed, which I, I think all of you would be subscribed, but please do consider it because it does help me a lot. And if you're wondering what to watch next, I'm going to do the whole Linus Tech Tips thing. You should check out the CraftBot review I put up last night because I'm pretty happy with the CraftBot. It's... It's a pretty decent machine. It's pretty noisy in my opinion, but a lot of you have already posted out how to make it quiet, which is cool. So yeah, thank you so much for watching, guys. Thank you very much to, what was it? Miss Muse? Lady, Lady Muse. Thank you so much to Lady Muse for assisting me. Um, unfortunately, she's not going to be here again next week, but I will, I will manage somehow. And have a great weekend, guys. I'll see you again soon here on Maker's Muse. Catch you later.